It was August, and it was warm. The longing for home was far greater this day than ever before. I thought I would take one last look at the beautiful surf hitting against the white cliffs, and they seemed to hit harder and prettier than I had ever seen them before. The water had a strange sound to it, as though it had been underscored for a beautiful motion picture. Each time a wave came up on the shore, I could hear the sound of oboe and flutes with the touch of French horn wailing far away. The feeling I had was one of momentary ecstasy. It wasn't until I looked at my watch that I realized I had spent better than two hours looking and listening to the fantastic show the Man Up High presented just for me. The realization had two effects upon me. I had overstayed a bit, and I knew that I would miss this romance I enjoyed for so long more than I could say. But as always, the compensation seemed even greater than what was being taken from me. The boat was set to leave in just one hour, and I had to hurry. The pier seemed to ascend from the water below. It was then that I realized I had traveled all the way from the pretty white cliffs to the boat, and never knew I was moving. This wasn't the first time I had a lapse, although it was but the second. I recall the last time, and it happened oddly enough, concerning her then too. It's frightening when we think back, and at the same time, it's such a priceless feeling to be able to recapture a moment that can never really be again. I was but 19, and at that time, I was still uncertain as to my station in life. Would I forever be one of many, or would my young fantasy-like dreams one day be a reality? I suspect at 19, every guy has somewhat of an inner feeling. He is unknown, uncared for, and is sure the world will function without him. And that was the time I first saw her. And when she strolled into my view, it was then I knew for sure. I shall not be unknown, uncared for, and the big fat world had better get ready to watch a man so important to her, she could not function without him. And from the time I first saw her to this very moment, it's been a great big lapse. For as long as it's been, I can still only think of what she means to me and how much I care. I really can't recall how long it's been going on, or what has happened up to now. All I do know is my mind, my body, and my heart all feel as though I had an overdose of sodium pentothal. I don't feel anything, but I'm very much aware. The next thing I had to do was to shake this dreamy feeling and step back into reality long enough to get on that boat that would glide me and my emotions swiftly to her. Well, I made the gangplank. But the boat didn't choose to assist me at all for the five days were more like three winters, a long summer, and finally, the spring. It's odd, but nevertheless, when we're happy, everything seems to be in evidence. For I had never noticed that a boat had rivets, that a woman was thinner than a man, that a child's voice had an elf-like quality. Water was heavy. I never knew that I had a watch pocket in my trousers or the lines in my hands went in a thousand different directions. I was also amazed to find that I walked taller, spoke more directly, and that I didn't care if my jacket pocket had been torn slightly. And I'll bet very few people are aware of the fact that lifeboat covers are canvas and are made in New London, Connecticut. The last night out, the water was terrible, rough. It seemed as though everyone was either ill or unhappy about it. Well, almost everyone. For I was even happier when my mind assured me it was only a bunch of fish, big and small, having a great big party down below celebrating my happy heart. The morning felt as though it was teasing me. It took more time finally showing its sleepy face than ever before, and the skyline of New York was scrubbing itself clean and pretty to welcome me. The Empire State Building seemed to bow low and respectfully as if to say, welcome home. The Statue of Liberty coyly winked at me, and when I winked back, you could feel her blush a bit. The gangplank was handled by the same longshoreman, the same longshoreman I had seen before, I suspect, only this time they seemed like they had been given special orders to dress and be pleasant upon my arrival, and how very silly they looked, 
dressed in their black jackets and bow ties. The cab driver opened the door for me and made sure I was cool and comfortable. He drove as though his pregnant wife sat in the back of the cab on the way to the hospital. Even the police officer on the corner apologized to the cabbie for barking at him. And how nice it was when the cabbie pulled up to the hotel and said, This one's on me. I was delighted and walked into the lobby, stopped at the desk, picked up my key and went into the elevator. The whistle in the elevator shaft sounded somewhat like the little wax whistle candy we bought as kids. And when the operator called my floor for the first time in days, I had a feeling of fear. I stepped out, heard the elevator door close, and then just leaned against the door for a moment. Then I was ready. I proceeded to open the door of the apartment, not realizing the door smoothly opened without sticking. It never did that before. I walked inside, and there she was. And I was happy. Oh, I almost forgot. Who was she? That's not important. Or if you're still with me and still curious as to who she is, then you have already benefited far more just from hearing about her than knowing who she is. And most people really only need to know about someone who has such feelings so that they can hope to have them sometime too. And actually, anybody can have them. All you have to do is what I did. Dream. Dream.